Luke chapter 12. Jesus gives warnings. Now, my friends, I want to tell you something. I've learned something out of my life. And that's this. When Jesus gives a warning, I need to heed that warning. There isn't one warning that the Lord ever gave that doesn't apply to me. It all applies to every single one of us. And what's interesting, when Jesus begins to teach to his disciples, his first warning, first of all, this is what I want to deal with. I doubt that any of us would have picked that warning. It is the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. It's play acting. It's pretending to be something that you're not in your heart in all reality. And the Lord says, trust me, there's coming a day where there'll be no secrets whatsoever. But my first warning, and again, because hypocrisy begins with the sin of pride, of you starting to feel like you're better than other people. And hypocrisy is the root of it. The second warning, and again, this is one that we, we hardly ever even think it's a sin. It is a sin of covetousness. And he said, I want you to understand something. One's life does not consist in the abundances of the things he's, he possesses. The Jews had a proverb of which I've never read before until I was studying for this message. And it's this. For every baby that's born in the world, babies are born with their finch of finches. Fist clenched. That's a, I'm ADD in case you haven't noticed it, but you'll be happy to know I married someone ADD and so we get along perfectly. So we, we both are on the same wavelength there. But babies are born with their fist clenched, meaning they're going to grasp for everything that the world has. But the Jewish proverb goes on to say, but everyone dies with their palms wide open. Because we brought nothing into this world and is certain we will take nothing out. And again, my friends, the Bible never teaches that money is wrong. It's just a place of where money is. And for this guy, the example that Jesus gave, I, 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 me, me, me. And the Lord said, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And so is he, it says in verse 21 of Luke 12, who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So the first warning, hypocrisy. The second warning, covetousness. The third warning is worry. Worry literally means to be torn apart, ripped apart. And the Lord reminds us, wait a minute. If I take care of the birds of the air, how much more am I going to take care of you? And then the Lord gives us a key to life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. My friends, basically all of us have three things. We have our time, and that's something we all have exactly the same. Nobody has more time or less time. We all get 24 hours of every day. So we all have our time. We all have our talents. Now, our talents are, are different. You know, I can't play the guitar like Dennis Agajanian. In fact, nobody can play the guitar like Dennis Agajanian, right? And, and I remember once I wanted to learn how to play the guitar. The Lord didn't let me. You know why? Because he afraid that if I played the guitar, I'd also sing. And that wouldn't be a pretty picture for you. So everyone's talents are differently. And then thirdly, treasures. And again, our treasures are all different. But here's the deal. The principle of what we do with our treasures, it's all exactly the same. And God should be first in every realm of our life, and it should be clearly evident. And then Jesus adds these very poignant words. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. So a very simple test, my friends. If I keep everything that I make for myself, where's my heart? My heart is selfish. I didn't make it up. Jesus said it, but it's really true. But if I make the Lord first in my life, and now he goes on with two other warnings in this chapter. So let's begin in verse number 35. 
Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding. That when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you, he will gird himself and have them set down and eat, and he will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so... Blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. So the fourth warning is this, beware of carelessness. Beware of not keeping in mind that the Lord can come back at any moment. And again, my friends, the Bible clearly teaches the imminent return of the Lord. That we will not know the day or the hour when he comes back, but we will know the season that he is going to come back. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians, we are taught this truth from chapter 5. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Now listen, for when they say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction comes upon them as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light, sons of the day. We are not of night, nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Now, here's the deal, my friends. Jesus Christ clearly teaches that he can come back at any time. The reason why he teaches that is that everyone who has this hope purifies himself. That's why, my friends, the the post-tribulation rapture teaching makes no sense whatsoever. And I'll tell you why. Because in the great tribulation, in the very center of it, when the Antichrist goes into the rebuilt temple at Jerusalem, and it's the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, we know there is exactly 1,260 days till Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom here on earth. We know that that number is 42 months, three and a half years, times, times, and a half time. We know the exact day, and the Bible clearly teaches we're not going to know that date. Now, here's the other thing that happens. If I told you that Jesus could come back in seven years. The best I can tell you is Jesus is coming back in seven years. I know some of you. You know what would happen? For six years, 350 days, you would live a terrible life. When I was in school, I'm the youngest of six boys. All my brothers were gone. It's the only vacation that my parents ever took. And it wasn't a very long vacation. But they made a tragic mistake. You know what that mistake was? They told me when they were returning. You never tell a teenager when you're returning. And my friends, here is the reality. The reality is... We don't know and we live in that expectancy of his return. And when we do that, it changes how we live. You see, there are people out there in the world who go, well, like last week, we had our youth retreat and they go, well, I asked Jesus into my heart when I was 16 years old. I'm not living for the Lord now, but doesn't matter. Good to go. When that rapture happens, I'm going to be caught up to heaven. Is that true? 
Because my friends, I have no idea what Bible they're reading because it isn't the Bible that we have and it's not the words of Jesus. So let's look at this, the warning. And my friends, again, if Jesus gives a warning, do we need to heed that warning? The warning against carelessness. Let your waist be girded and your lamps be burning. In 1 Peter chapter 1, the scripture declares in verse number 13, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you by the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. My friends, it is a sad moral state of America when the number one movie for Valentine's weekend is a pornography movie that degrades women. And, And... that people would actually think that's okay to go to. And my friends, the scripture goes on. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves through the time of your sojourning here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus. So he says, let your waist be girded. In Bible times, how'd they dress? The men all wore long flowing robes. I can't work in a robe like that. I can't run in a robe like that. I can only walk in it. So when I had to do work, there was a certain way that I'd have to gird up my loins with this robe. The Bible tells us that when we put on the full armor of God, that belt that girds up our loins is truth. And this, my friends, is the truth from Jesus' lips himself. The next example is that the lamp and the bridegroom. Now, from Matthew chapter 25, we have that account that Jesus gives to us. And Jesus says in Matthew 25, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And again, oil is symbol of that Holy Spirit working in our life. But while the bridegroom was delayed, and I want you to notice there is a theme throughout this entirety of the Bible that deals with this every time that the Lord's coming isn't going to be quite as quick as people thought it would be. That when the bridegroom delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard. And behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of the oil for our lamps are going out. And the wise answered and said, no, lest there should not be enough for, you, uh, for us and you, but go rather and uh, to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And when they came to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready with him went in and the wedding and the door was shut. And afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you do not know neither the day or the hour that the Son of Man is coming. My friends, here's the reality. Jesus would say, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. As in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that that Noah went into the ark. For 120 years, anybody could have been saved. For 120 years, Noah is an example and he's preaching righteousness. But there would come a day. Noah had forewarned the people that there would be a great day of judgment coming. But they mocked him. They made fun. They did not listen. God calls Noah to go into the ark. And my friends, I want to tell you something. Noah doesn't shut the door of the ark. 
He doesn't have a big pulley system and get all of his boys there and go, okay, guys, let's shut the door of the ark. The, day, the door of the ark is open yet another seven days. Anybody could have come in. And you know what the Bible says? God shut the door. And at that moment, at that time, the great fountains of the deep burst open and it began to rain. At this point, it's too late. And my friends, just like the wise and the foolish virgins, there are people that are pretenders of Christianity. Maybe you are married to a Christian. Maybe your parents are Christian. But my friends, I want to tell you something. That doesn't make you a Christian. And at that moment of the trumpet call of God, when the believers are going to be caught up together with the Lord to meet the Lord in the air and thus be with him forevermore, there will be those who are left behind. They're left behind because they did not heed this warning that Jesus gives. Does it matter how we live? Does it matter what we're doing? My friends, it goes on in the Gospel of Luke to tell us this. Let your lamps be burning and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding. And that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Now, my friends, we can't read these words without remembering a letter that Jesus wrote in the book of Revelation. Seven letters to seven churches, which have meanings to all churches of all ages. But first of all, the last two churches in the book of Revelation that Jesus writes, one is Philadelphia. That's the church that we want to be. We want to be the church of Philadelphia. Philadelphia means brotherly love. It is the mission-minded church. It is the church that is adhering to the word of God. It is the church that's sending out missions. That is the church. And Jesus gives to that church a promise. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. But then there's the next church. It's a church of Laodicea, which means lukewarm. That church's self-assessment is we're rich. We have need of nothing. And my friends, you will find this church all over the place. It's not hard. Turn on your TV to the religious channels and you'll see this church all over the place where the pastor's grinning from ear to ear telling you how wonderful you are. We'll never take a stand on anything that is sin and we'll never say one word to even remotely possibly offend anyone. And my friends, people adore it and flock to it. And Jesus says this. Because you are neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. And you know what Jesus says? He's not even in that church. You know what he says? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And I want to tell you something. The Lord is here standing at the door of every single heart that is here today. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus is teaching about uh, prayer and he ends by saying this. He begins by saying to be persistent in prayer. And he gives a, a, a whole opposite parallel. There is an unjust judge and a widow. And finally, the widow beats the unjust uh, down so that he gives. Now, my friends, that's not how the Lord is. First of all, he's not an unjust judge. He is our loving heavenly father. Second of all, we are not a widow. But he ends up by asking a question, will I find faith on the earth when I return? And that's exactly what Jesus is dealing here with in the watchfulness against carelessness. Because I want to tell you, there is denomination after denomination who has careened off into liberalism. 
There before the Supreme Court of our nation are lawsuits that will be determining whether we redefine what marriage is. Did you guys hear about one of our Supreme Court justices who fell asleep during the State of the Union speech? Now, hey, Ruth Ginsburg is her name. She didn't like just doze off. I mean, she, I mean, she is out of it. I mean, she couldn't, she couldn't fall over any more than she was, all right? She wrote this last week why she fell asleep. You know why she fell asleep? She drank too much. I'm not sure about you, but I have great concern that our justices aren't sober when they're making their decisions. And my friends, again, there is a growing chorus in our country that go, well, it's fine, you know. I I know some homosexuals. They're nice people. And, you know, my son is a homosexual or my grandson or my granddaughter. And they're really, really nice. And, you know, if you love one another. And, well, can't we just ignore what the Bible says? Now, first of all, that's not the worst of sins. You're out there fornicating. That actually heads the list. Adultery is right there as well. But the reality is this. Does it matter how we live? And can we live any way that we want and still be good to go? Because that's not what the scripture teaches. And that's not what Jesus says. And it's definitely not what's taught anywhere in scripture. So here's the warning. And he says in verse 37, blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you, he will gird himself and have them come down and sit down and eat and he will serve them. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, the last words that the apostle Paul writes, he says in verse number 8, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only to me also, but to all who have loved his appearing. You see what we're called to do here? We're called to watch. Jesus would have two words concerning his return. He'd use over and over, watch and pray. Now, if he should come in the second watch, Or come in the third. In other words, it's going to be longer than you think. And find them so blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come in, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. And then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all the people? And the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the Lord writes this truth to us in verse number 2. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. In other words, my friends... We've all been given something. What is it? We've all been given time, our talents, and our treasure. The question is, how are we using those times, treasures, and talents until Jesus comes? Are we being faithful with him? Because whatever we do in this life is the basis for the positions that we're going to have in heaven. And my friends, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 4, it says, Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. Here's why. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good nor bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God and I trust are known to your own conscience. So here's the deal. 
Every single one of us as a steward will have to give an account. An account to God for how we lived and what we did. And the Bible uses a very amazing picture for us that it all has to pass through a fire. And there is gold, silver, and precious stones. And there's wood, hay, and stubble. Now, I got a hot tip for you. Wood, hay, and stubble, and fire, they don't, you know, don't worry about too much coming out. Gold? Does fire hurt gold? Just makes it more valuable, doesn't it? Does fire hurt silver? No. Does fire hurt hurt diamonds? No. You can still find those through the fire. So are we doing with our lives as a steward of our life anything that's going to make a difference for eternity? Do you realize the Bible teaches even if I give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, it's going to be recorded. Do you realize that every time I volunteer, it's going to be recorded? For every dollar that I give, I can't take anything with me, but I can send ahead as I'm investing because wherever my treasure is, that's where my heart's going to be. And so the scripture goes on, blessed is that servant in verse 43, whom his master will find so doing when he comes. How many Marines do we have here? If you're a Marine, stand up. We want to thank you for serving our country. Thank you very much. And the Marine motto is what? Semper Fi, which means what? Always faithful. It means what? Means what? It means what? Always faithful. And my friends, should we be any less for the kingdom of God than always faithful? And I want to tell you, when that day comes and we have been faithful to the Lord, you know what we're going to hear? Well done, good and faithful servant. Come now and share in your master's happiness. Now the scripture goes on. Truly I say to you, he will make him a ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the men servants and the maid servants and to eat and drink and be drunk. You see, my friends, when we lose the edge of the warning that Jesus gives that he could come back at any moment and we are filled with carelessness. It is always marked by two things, brutality and carnality. Those two go together, brutality and carnality. And the scripture goes on to say, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Jesus is going to say exactly the same thing in Luke chapter 21. In Luke chapter 21, verse 34, and Luke 21 all deals with the end of the age. Jesus says this, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighted down with carousing drunkenness and the cares of this life, and that day come up on you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. Then Jesus said, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things and, and that come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. How many of you want to be drunk when the rapture happens? You want to be somewhere getting high when the rapture happens? Do you want to be in somebody else's bed when the rapture happens? Because did Jesus say in Luke 21, well, as long as you said the sinner's prayer, you're good to go. Is that what he said? What did he say? Watch and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass. The others are weighted down. I'm pretty sure it's not going to do you any good to jump when the rapture happens. You're going to be ensnared. So what does that mean? You're going to be left behind. Now, can you get saved at that point? 
Can you truly surrender your heart to the Lord at that point? Yeah. There's a great multitude that gets saved. Read about it in Revelation chapter 7. But my friends, it's going to cost them something. And for the most part, they're going to be executed. And let's see. How is it that they're going to be executed in the book of Revelation? What is it that they do? What's it called? Beheading. I know a group that does that. And my friends, it does matter how you live, right? And every portion of Scripture lays that true. Now, it goes on to say, And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know and yet committed things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few. For, to, for everyone to whom much is given from him, much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. In First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 9, the scripture says, For they themselves declare concerning us, what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the true and living God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath that is to come. In other words, live in readiness. Now, Jesus says, I came to send fire on the earth. And how I wished it was already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how distressed I am until it's accomplished. The baptism of judgment that Jesus would be immersed in would be fulfilled on the cross. Jesus on his way to Jerusalem would repeat it over and over. I must go to Jerusalem. I must be handed over. I must suffer many things. I must be crucified. And at that point, the disciples couldn't deal with anything else because they never heard him, Jesus say, and I must be raised from the dead. But we find when we get to Luke chapter 22, Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. And in verse 42, he says, Father, if it is your will, remove this cup from me. Yet nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And I want you to listen. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, he had come to his disciples. He found them sleeping from sorrow. In agony, in distress, for the judgment that Jesus was taking upon himself. Now the scripture says, Do not suppose that I came to give peace on earth. I tell you not at all, but rather division. From now on, five will be in one house, will be divided, three against two and two against three. A father will be divided against a son and a son against his father and a mother against her daughter and a daughter against her mother and mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. I want to tell you, this is exactly what would happen. You go, well, wait a minute. How, how could that be? Didn't when the angels sing at Jesus' birth and say, Glory to God in the highest on our earth, peace, goodwill to men. But I want to tell you, when you make a confession of Christ in your life, it can mean your family will declare war on you. It did in my family. My father, who was an atheist, from the moment that I told him I had become a Christian and asked Jesus into my heart with absolute full intention, he looked at me and he said he was going to hire a deprogrammer to deprogram me. This was back in the days of the Moonies in 1975. And my friends, I want to tell you, he was not happy at all. And when I actually shared with him a year and a half later that I felt a call of God on my life to go into ministry, all hell broke loose. And not just with my father, but with many of my relatives. And it cost something. I would be disowned by my father. But I want to tell you where Mike and Cheryl... Uh, Yostar up there in Idaho, where Chris and Lydia are in Utah, 
I just got a letter because Calvary Satellite Radio Network is all over in Utah. And you got to understand something. When you live in a Mormon community like Chris and Lydia do or like the Yost do, where 90% is Mormon, you got to understand they control absolutely everything. This guy wrote me a letter and said, I was listening to CSN. I became a secret believer two years ago. I was raised a Mormon. I went on a Mormon mission. My family's Mormon. My wife's family is Mormon. And now it's time for me to tell my wife and family that I'm a Christian. And I want to tell you what happens in those areas. They lose their jobs. He could lose his wife. His family could have nothing to do with him. And in certain cases, you have to move out of the neighborhood. You can't live there. The the ex-Mormons that we had that were here, that the whole family had become a Christian. You remember, she was a professor. The mother was a professor at BYU. (laughs) Let me tell you, you're not a professor at BYU after you become a Christian. You're kicked out. And in fact, they had to leave the area where they lived. And so there is a price to pay. But my friends, do you realize that the people who are becoming Christians in more Muslim countries, and there's more now than ever in the history of mankind, for them, you know what it can mean with their family? That their family takes a vow to kill them. Honor killing. To make sure and the entire family takes that vow not to let that one that turned away from Islam continue to live. So what Jesus says is absolutely the truth. Now the last warning that Jesus gets, gives is against spiritual dullness. And my friends, he uses two examples. One is the weather report and the two is going off to uh, a lawyer, to a judge. But my friends, I want to tell you something. If we heed Jesus' warnings against carelessness on his return, I want to tell you it will deal with everything else. It will deal with the hypocrisy in our life. It will deal with covetousness in our life. It will deal with worry in our life. And it will deal with spiritual dullness. And then he said to the multitudes, when you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming. And so it is. That's exactly how Israel is. Their storms come off the Mediterranean Ocean in the west. And when you see the south wind blowing, it's like our Santa Ana winds here. That wind's coming off the desert. There's not going to be any rain with the Santa Anas. The wind blowing, you say there will be hot weather. And there is hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky and of the earth. But how is it you do not discern the time? And again, my friends, in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, I, Daniel, understood by the book the number of the years specified by Jeremiah the prophet concerning the time that Israel would be in captivity. And then he said... And then I prayed. You see, my friends, again, we have a saying here. What is it? Read your Bible and pray every day. Can we discern the times that we live in? Now, I want to ask you a question. If I came to you next week and I have to talk in a soft, super spiritual voice. I prayed and fasted all week. And God revealed to me secrets that nobody else knows. And I know the exact day that Jesus Christ is going to return. What's the response? A liar. Why am I a liar? Because the Bible says no man's going to know the day or the hour. But my friends, will we be able to know the season? And the answer to that question is yes. Yes. And so, my friends, it's so important that we understand Jesus here is saying we should be able to discern the coming storm that there is and the seasons that there are in life. And here's what he says to do about it. In verse 57, yes, and why even yourselves? Do you not judge what is right? 
When you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge and the judge deliver you to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you shall not depart from there until you've paid the very last penny. One last scripture that I want to take you to. Turn with me in your Bibles to Second Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says in verse number 3, or Apostle Peter, excuse me, says in verse number 3, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lust. So don't be surprised in the last days people go, where is the promise of his coming? Oh, you Christians, it's always been the same. And then he even says there'll be two prevalent lies in the last days. Number one, that God is not the creator. And the reason why they make that law is so that men can live according to their own lusts. And that's exactly what we have with a sexual perversion in our land today. Secondly, they will willfully deny the flood of Noah. Because the flood of Noah, as it was in the days of Noah, Jesus gives this warning, in the days of Noah, judgment for wicked behavior was going to happen. And my friends, judgment for wicked behavior is coming again. And so Peter warns us of that. And then he goes on to say, but beloved, do not forget this one thing in verse number eight. That with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but as some count slackness, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Right here, right now, the Lord's standing at the door. Right now, you can still come in. Right now is the time to make peace with the judge. Because judgment is coming. But you must make peace with the judge before the day of judgment happens. On the way, Jesus said, make peace with the judge. And the very next verse, but the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. And then it goes on to say, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of the, which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent he heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So right here, this second is the time to make your peace with the judge of all the universe. Right now is a time to wake up from your slumber. Right now is a time to stop getting drunk, stop getting high, stop sleeping around, stop living in the ways of sin and be ready for Jesus' return, which could happen at any moment. So let's pray right now together. Lord Jesus, I do believe your word and I do believe your warnings. And so, Lord, I want to have a right heart. I never want to be a hypocrite. I never want to be filled with covetousness. I never want to be consumed with worry. I don't want to be careless when I think of your return. I want to live in readiness. And so I ask for your forgiveness. Come into my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I want to walk with you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.